ago, I was reading an article about the greatest leaders in American history. And the columnist was writing about political figures like James Madison and Susan B. Anthony. Uh, he also wrote about uh, a, biz- a political figure whose name was Thomas Paine. But then the article was talking about business moguls like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. But what I found completely fascinating is the author stated that one of the people who made the biggest impact in American history was actually Henry Ford. Now, the reason I found that so interesting is because Henry Ford wasn't a politician. He didn't sign the Declaration of Independence. He didn't fire a musket in the Revolutionary War. Henry Ford was an entrepreneur. When Henry Ford was 16 years old, he left his hometown in a little place in Michigan, and he went to work in Detroit as a machinist. And after several years at this factory, he decided to go home to work at his his parents' farm. But no matter how many hours he spent in the field, Henry Ford was just enamored with motors. In fact, he was so fascinated with engines that in 1896, he built a vehicle he called a quadricycle which was a light metal frame that had four bicycle tires and a two-cylinder motor. And even though he was so proud of his design, he wanted to make it better. So what Henry Ford did was he sold the quadricycle and he used the money to start making other types of vehicles. But then he took the biggest step of his life. Henry Ford got some venture capital and he went on to start the Ford Motor Company. And after one month of being in business, they produced a car that was called the Model A. And even though Henry Ford liked it, he thought he could make it better. So in 1908, he designed a car that he called the Model T. And this vehicle changed the way that Americans lived, worked, and traveled. Now, the reason this car made such a huge impact on our culture was because of the way Henry Ford had it built. You see, in the early 1900s, it took about 12 hours for them to assemble a vehicle. And the reason it took, took such a long time is because they had to make each vehicle from scratch. They had to cut the steel, weld the frame, install the motor, tighten every nut and bolt. And it took such a long time that they could only assemble one car every 12 hours. So what Henry Ford did was... He came up with the idea of assembly line production. His thought that it was that he could hire a bunch of people to work at his factory and each one of them would make a different part of the car. Some would make fenders all day, others would paint all day, some people would install motors all day, and Ford broke his assembly down into 84 distinct steps and each step would assemble a different part of the car. But his new process didn't take 12 hours. Henry Ford was able to assemble a new car every two and a half hours. And the result was the Model T became one of the best-selling cars in history. In fact, from 1908 to 1927, the Ford Motor Company made over 150 million Model Ts and it's still ranked as one of the best-selling cars in history. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, because some of you might be thinking, hey, Scott, that's super cool to hear about Henry Ford and the Model T, but what does that have to do with my, my relationship with God? Well, this actually has more to do with your faith than you could possibly imagine. Because while Henry Ford set the standard for mass car production, There was a church in the Bible that set the standard too. They didn't set a record for Sunday school attendance or how many people came to their Easter services. Scripture tells us that this congregation set the standard for what an effective church should be. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1.7. He said, and so you became a model to all the believers In Macedonia and Achaia, the Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. And don't miss what the Bible said there. 
Because scripture tells us that this group of believers was so amazing, so committed that their faith in God became known all over the world. And the Bible doesn't say that about any other congregation, which leads us to ask a very important question. And that question is, what made this church so different? What was it about this group of people that made them so infectious and so contagious that they were considered to be a model? Well, for the next seven weeks, we're going to answer that question. Because over the next seven weeks, we're going to take an in-depth look at what made this church so different from all the rest. And when you understand what they really went through, when you understand what they had to endure, you will be amazed. But in order for this entire series to make sense, I need to take a minute to tell you how this church got started. You see, back in the first century, there was a church planning guy whose name was the Apostle Paul. And what Paul would do is he would travel to all kinds of cities around the Mediterranean Rim, and he would tell the people in these cities the truth about God's love. Well, in Acts 17, Paul traveled to the city of Thessalonica, now, the city of Thessalonica was located in modern-day Greece. It had a population of about 30,000 people, and this was an extravagantly wealthy town. Now, the reason they had such a thriving economy was because of its location. As you can see on the map behind me, Thessalonica was located right on the coast of the Aegean Sea. So what would happen is, Ships would bring all kinds of commerce into the harbor, but they also would export goods at the same time. But the other thing that made this city so well known was it was located at the intersection of two major Roman roads, the Ignatian Way and the road that led from the Danube to the Aegean. And because of their unique location... Thousands of people would travel through Thessalonica on a consistent basis. And as travelers came to town, they would go and conduct business at the Agora, which is where all the political and social events in that town took place. Or they would go and buy and sell, sell products at the market that was located right in the center of town. They could also go and watch plays at the amphitheater. Or they could just go and spend time at the forum. Because even at this time in history, the forum had these beautifully decorated arches and water fountains that worked. And as you can see, this city had a very rich culture. The problem was nobody had ever told them about Jesus. The majority of the people who lived in the city of Thessalonica were either Jewish, which means they believed the Old Testament to be true, or they were Greek, which means they believed in the gods of the Greek pantheon. Zeus, Poseidon, Hermes, Demeter, Aphrodite, they believed that those gods were real. And one day, the Apostle Paul goes into the city of Thessalonica, and I want you to see what happens in Acts 17, 1. It says, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, which means Paul always did this, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving, not yelling and screaming. When Paul went into, this, into the synagogue, he didn't yell, he didn't scream. The Bible says he explained and proved that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. So the Bible tells us that when Paul went to the city of Thessalonica, he goes to a local synagogue and for three Sabbath days in a row, he does his best to teach these people the truth about God's love. He just opens up the scriptures and says, look, I want you to see this for yourself. God loved you so much and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And scripture shows that the Messiah had to suffer and goes through these things. Jesus really is God's son and you have the hope of eternal life through what he did on the cross. And verse 4 says, 
some of the Jews believed and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. When the Thessalonian people heard the truth for themselves, they believed it. And a large number of those individuals gave their life to Christ. But this is where the story takes a very unusual turn because this is where things get completely out of control. Look at what happens next in verse 5. It says, But other Jews, which means the men who didn't believe that Jesus was God's son, but other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Now don't miss what happens here. When all these people start giving their life to Christ, some of the Jewish leaders got insanely jealous. And instead of dealing with their feelings in an appropriate manner, they decide to form a mob and turn the entire city upside down. And do you know what's so unusual about their behavior? What's so peculiar is the Bible said that's exactly what would happen Because James 3.16 says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition. In other words, when these two things begin to come to the surface, there, at that place, in that heart, in that mind, in that life, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that every sin has its own repercussions, but envy is in a category all of its own. Because whenever jealousy comes bubbling to the surface, when somebody just can't get those feelings of, I hate him, I hate her, I hate how rich they are, I hate how pretty she is, I hate how thin they are, I hate that race of people, I just can't stand them. When those feelings come bubbling to the surface, at that place and in that life, you will find some of the most insidious behavior. And we don't just see that happen in Thessalonica. We see the devastating effects of envy all throughout Scripture. Because Cain was so jealous of his brother Abel that he killed him. Joseph's brothers were so envious of the way that their dad treated him that they took their own brother and sold him into slavery. Saul just couldn't stand the fact that the Hebrew people loved David as their leader. So Saul did everything he could to make David's life miserable. But they weren't the only ones who experienced the devastating effects of envy because Matthew 27, 18 says, for Pilate knew it was out of envy that they handed Jesus over to be crucified. Of all the destructive behaviors in scripture, there is none more deadly and more divisive than this emotion of envy. Because when somebody allows that to take control of who they are, the results can be devastating. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because there is a person or a group of people in your life that every time you're around them, all you feel is, I just can't stand them. And if we are really to peel back the layers of the onion, there's a part of us that would admit the reason that I don't like them, the reason I can't stand who they are, is because I wish I had what they had. And that's exactly what was happening in Thessalonica. The Jewish leaders couldn't take the fact that so many people were giving their life to Christ. And I want you to see what happens at the end of verse 5. It says, but other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. 
Now, if you've ever wondered how dangerous it was to be a believer in the first century, you don't need to look any further than these verses. Because in the Roman world, there were no laws about invasion of privacy, breaking and entering, forming a mob. In the Roman world, it was might makes right. Whoever has the most power is in control. And if you could just get enough people angry, there was no limit to what you could do. You could have innocent people arrested or even put to death and not because of a crime that they committed. You could have innocent people executed simply for what they believed. And that's exactly what they were trying to do to the disciples. This mob broke into somebody's house with the intent of dragging Paul and Silas out and beating them to death. But verse 6 says, when they did not find Paul and Silas, they dragged. They didn't escort. They didn't walk with. They dragged Jason and some other believers before the local magistrate shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world, have now come here. And Jason, finger pointing, Jason has welcomed them into his house. Now the disciples weren't causing trouble. They weren't robbing banks and stealing cars. All they were doing was trying to help people understand the truth for themselves, but they were accused of breaking the law. And look at what they were accused of in verse 7. It says, they are all, which means every person who believes that Jesus is God's son, they are all defying Caesar's decree, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Now, do you know what's so odd about this story? What's so peculiar is this congregation got started under some very stressful circumstances. Because Paul was only in the city of Thessalonica for three weeks. And as soon as men and women started putting their faith in Jesus, their entire world came crashing down around them. I mean, there were mob scenes and riots and magistrates and people being accused of crime. And you know what's weird about that? What's weird about that is there is going to be a time in your life when you will experience the very same thing. I'm not talking about getting arrested or a mob scene, but what I am saying is there are going to be times in your faith journey when you feel like you're doing the right thing. You're spending time in prayer. You're doing the things that you feel God is calling you to do. You're being faithful to your wife. You're loving your husband. And out of nowhere, everything in your world will start spiraling out of control. And there'll be a part of you that wonders, God, where are you? I feel like I'm doing the right thing. If you remember... On Easter Sunday, uh, we shared a story with you about a guy whose name was Nabil Karishi. And if you remember, Nabil Karishi was born in Pakistan, and his parents immigrated to America when he was just a child. And when Nabil moved to the States, he and his family were completely dedicated to the Islamic faith. They, were, they followed all the customs, all the rituals, and Nabil grew up believing that the teachings of Muhammad were real. But while Nabil was in medical school, he got room with a guy whose name is David Wood. And David was a man who really understood the truth about God's love. And over the course of several months, David and Nabil became good friends. So David challenged Nabil to do something he'd never done before. He challenged him to read the Bible for himself. Because David thought, man, if he'll just see it, if he'll just read it for himself, it could change everything. And Nabil did. But the reason Nabil read it is because he wanted to find flaws and prove David wrong. But the more Nabil read, the more convinced he became that Jesus really was God's son. 
and he ended up giving his life to Christ and getting baptized. But that's where the story changed a little bit. Because after Nabil graduated from medical school, he decided that he wasn't going to be a doctor. Instead, he was going to spend the rest of his life being an evangelist. He wanted to help people who grew up in the same environment as him understand a truth that he was fortunate enough to know. So one afternoon, Nabil and his roommate went to a Muslim street festival. And while they were at this Muslim street festival, a group of teenagers came up and were asking Nabil and his roommate about why they believed that Jesus was God's son. And while he was answering their questions, Nabil and his roommate were arrested. And they were charged with disturbing the peace. The reason they were arrested is because they were telling people the truth about God's love. Well, Nabil and his roommate went to court. And after a very long court battle, both Nabil and his roommate were found not guilty. In fact, the city of Dearborn, Michigan, issued a formal apology for violating their First Amendment rights. And even though Nabil went through some really challenging circumstances, he has continued to do the right thing and tell people the truth about God's love. And even though this church in Thessalonica went through some really hard things when they first got started, you're going to see over the next seven weeks how this congregation went on to become the only church that the Bible says is a model. Let me pray for us. God, the one fascinating thing about this topic is for a lot of Americans, it's hard to understand. And it doesn't make us bad or horrible people, but the truth is, is nobody walked in this room today afraid that somebody was going to bust in the doors and have us all arrested because we were talking the truth and telling people about you. Nobody was afraid of that. Nobody was afraid to carry a Bible in public for fear of being arrested thrown into prison, beaten with rods. None of us even thought about that. But the reality is, there was a time in history when this was so real. And not only was it real, it was dangerous. It was frightening. But in the midst of the circumstances that these people went through, they went on to set an example for every other congregation around the Mediterranean Rim. And God, my hope for us, as we kind of walk through this series, my hope is that we as a congregation can learn what they did right. That we can understand where they were coming from. Because in their world where this was completely illegal, if they can make the kind of impact that they made, it makes me wonder what we can do here in a country where we are very, very free. So God, my prayer is, you know, beyond the dog and the doctor and the dating life and we got, you know, stuff, all these things that kind of surround and cloud our judgment, would you just for the next seven weeks, it'd be great if this was our life, but would you for the next few weeks allow us to push the pause button on all of the stuff that we have going on so that we really could learn what it means to be a model. What would it look like if we modeled our faith to our children, to our wife, to our coworkers? What would it look like if when our name came up in conversation, people would go, oh my gosh, they're the model. They're the model employee, they're the model business owner, they're the model citizen. What would it look like if we took the next seven weeks to go, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna learn what it really means to be a model.
in every area of life. God, thank you so much for the chance we got to be here this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.